Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, providing more than 41,000 jobs in the production of wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details at ChooseWood.com. Welcome to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Don Marsh. It may come as a surprise to some to learn that a national campaign is underway to amend the U.S. Constitution. Proponents want a 28th Amendment to basically reverse the Supreme Court Citizens United ruling, allowing corporations and unions to pour money into politics. Supporters say the amendment is designed to combat systematic political corruption and level the political playing field. Joining me in studio is attorney Jeff Clements. He is the author of Corporations Are Not People, Reclaiming Democracy from Big Money and Global Corporations. He's also founder of American Promise, a nonprofit that supports the 28th Amendment. He's part of a town hall meeting here to win support for the amendment. Also with us, St. Louis 15th Ward Alderwoman Megan Green, co-sponsor of a resolution favoring the amendment. Thanks both for being with us. Nice to have you. Jeff, good to see you. Um, Let me start with you with a a very basic question to be sure that everyone understands what we're talking about. What is Citizens United? Some people may not may not know. Yeah, thanks, Don. Good to be here. And you know, Citizens United sounds like a good thing, right? We want citizens to be united, but it actually isn't a very good thing for the country. Uh, The name Citizens United comes from the Supreme Court case in 2010, Citizens United versus the Federal Election Commission. And that's the case where the Supreme Court, five to four, struck down our campaign finance laws, mm-hmm. longstanding rules that were intended to level the playing field so that all Americans can be heard in our electoral process. The court ruled that corporations and uh, have the same rights as people and that money is just like free speech. And therefore, we, the American people, really aren't allowed to have reasonable limits on campaign finance, according to the Supreme Court. And the impact so far has been? Well, there's been over $40 billion spent in elections since then. I think every uh, community in America has now seen, if we can't limit money, the donations that, to political candidates and organizations that used to be significant already are now six, seven, even eight-figure donations. And that means very few people are providing most of the money, and it's the people and the corporations and the unions and the special interests that are providing the money that are getting the representation, not the everyday uh, American citizen. How would a 28th Amendment read? Well, there are a couple of different versions, but it's actually uh, come a long way. And there's uh, a a version that has been introduced by Senator Tom Udall that actually has 42 co-sponsors in the Senate, about 170 co-sponsors in the House. And what it does is say, uh, Section 1, essentially, the states and Congress, i.e., I. we the people, uh, have the power to enact reasonable campaign finance uh, laws in order to secure the integrity of our government and the equal right of all Americans to uh, be an equal citizen in our republic. Section 2 then says, when we make those laws, we can distinguish between human beings and corporations. For example, uh, we may decide that we want to limit contributions to $500, $1,000, more money for more people. There will be plenty of enough money in the political system for campaigns, but it would come from more people. And we might say, well, we want corporations to have a zero limit. Corporations and unions are economic entities, not political actors. They're not citizens. And they should be out in the economic sphere, not the political sphere. So that's one very good version. Um, There's other ideas that go to varying degrees along those lines. And, uh, you know, we have time to do this. And that's why we're here in St. Louis and going around the country with the Writing the 28th Amendment project. The beauty of this, it's the first amendment in the digital age. Every American can step up Mm -hmm. and decide what they think it should say, and we'll get the language right. Megan Green, what is your your interest in this? So I I think a lot of folks in St. Louis who know me know that I have uh, been a very vocal uh, supporter of limits on the amount of money that can go into our political system, Um, you know, prior to even being a a huge Bernie Sanders supporter, which is something that a lot of people in St. Louis associate me with, uh, because we see the influence of money um, throughout our political system, whether it's at the federal level or the local level. We mm-hmm. we see the, the folks who have the money are the ones who are able to pay the lobbyists to be at even the Board of Aldermen to try to influence decisions. They're the ones who are giving to, to campaigns that um, then help put people in office and keep people in office. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I think 
as we've seen an, an increase in, in corporate money, special interest money that's going into this in a, into a lot of campaigns, we also see um, democracy being diluted to a certain extent. We we see that that less grassroots candidates are able to really be uh, competitive against so much of, of this special interest money. What's what's the status of Resolution Two Forty, which is you've co-sponsored? So it, it passed the board. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, we're on mm-hmm. recess right now. And so before we went on recess, it did pass the board. Um, there were no objections to it. And, and I think it's a good first step for us in the city to, to start to really broach the conversation around this issue. Um, and, and I hope that going forward, we start to look at some of our own uh, campaign finance structures in the city. R- right now, um, our campaign finance limits are $10,000 um, for an alderman, but they're only 2600 to give to a state rep or to governor. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can actually give more to a local elected official right now in our state than you can to somebody running for statewide office. Um, so, so I think that there, there's a, a role that we need to be playing in St. Louis to elevate the issue, to talk about the issue, um, so that hopefully when we get to a place that a 28th Amendment um, comes around, we're, we're ready and we're educated to support it. Jeff Clements, uh, Clements you uh, want a lot more Megan Greens out there, don't you? Well, you know, we want a lot more Megan Greens, but we want a lot more um, Don Marsh, a lot more of everybody <laughs> out there who it's going to take everybody to win a constitutional amendment. Mm-hmm. And, you know, fortunately, Don, we have uh, Americans across the political spectrum, across the country, stepping up for this. So I was delighted um, to hear from Megan uh, that St. Louis has become the latest city in America to pass a resolution in support of this 28th Amendment. But we now have 800 cities and towns that have done that, 19 states. And so it's a, I, you know, um, it's, it's great to be here with Megan and great to be here with you. But what I can tell you and tell the folks in St. Louis is this is happening everywhere. And it doesn't matter if it's a red state, blue state. Americans know we have to do something about this money in our political system. You know, I said at the outset that it may surprise some people to know that there is this campaign going on there. I was a little surprised. I I was not really totally aware that this sort of thing was going on. I mean, I'm sure there are a lot of people like me out there. There sure are, and that's you know, that's why we appreciate you having yeah. us on the show. Yeah. I hope uh, we'll get on uh, get the word out a lot more because um, you know it, it it is I think in a lot of ways the untold story. Of, uh, of our politics today. There's an awful lot of stories about how divided we are, about how we're failing, about how we can't do anything big anymore as a country. Mm-hmm. And meanwhile, you have this extraordinary campaign driven by the people at the grassroots in every single state to win a constitutional amendment to really renew the foundation of our democracy. But what can individuals do? I can understand how a Megan Green or the Board of Aldermen uh, could be effective in passing resolutions, but what can... Um, Joe Sixpack can do. Well, Joe Sixpack can do a lot. Everybody can do something. And so at American Promise, um, our whole model is about citizen empowerment. It's not going to be something we do. What we say to folks is um, this will be something that you do, and we can help you do it. So what we try to do, and we have an American Promise Association, a local Mm -hmm. one, right here in St. Louis – uh, with Chip Cooper and, and Jenny and a lot of good folks who helped support that uh, local um, resolution. And that's going on around the country. And they're doing letters to the editor. They're doing meetings with members of Congress of both parties. And it really is the, the citizen at the grassroots level. No one else is going to do this for us. I think one thing we've learned in, in, the, in the past decade or so is there's no savior. If we just elect the right person, somehow everything is going to be fixed. It, it really is up to Joe Sixpack. It's up to the American citizen to step up together and get this done. And there's a lot to do. So you can see a lot more at AmericanPromise.net about very specific ways individual people can help. We will put a link to your website on ours at stlpublicradio.org. I have some questions about process, which I'll ask in a moment. But I want to bring in Diane calling from Glendale before she gets tired of waiting. (laughs) Go ahead, Diane. Yes, thank you for taking my call. Um, I have not read the Supreme Court's arguments for um, ruling in favor of Citizens United, but to me it just seems so obviously inconsistent. They just handed uh, corporations the ability to have their cake and eat it too, because on the one hand, the whole purpose of forming an LLC is to limit personal liability. So, you know, if, if you own a corporation... You are no longer personally liable if they sue you, 
and yet, on the other hand, you are considered an individual. So I, I'm just interested in hearing uh, your guest comments on that. Jeff, why don't you start that? Um, sure. Well, your your call is quite right. The idea of um, a corporation or a limited liability company, those are uh, entities, essentially, that state law allows us to use for economic activities for very good reasons, like limited liability and aggregating capital and, and, and people to in order to do good and, and helpful economic things. And uh, the whole idea of that is to, you know, separate it from the person, the real human being, for legal purposes. And so when the court said, well, those economic entities that actually are created under the laws of we the people somehow now have rights above the people to strike down our laws that attempt to regulate them so the economic money doesn't wipe out the political equality that we all want, um, we've gone, we've really done something wrong. So the court repeatedly in Citizens United referred to corporations, not really as corporations. The word they kept using is speakers or voices. And, you know, that sounds like maybe not so dangerous when it's a nonprofit business or nonprofit um, advocacy group like Citizens United itself. Mm -hmm. So there may have been some sympathetic facts in that case. But the court did nothing to make any distinction between a small nonprofit and a global corporation that has international shareholders, sovereign funds as shareholders, no transparency, and now all that kind of capital is free to pour into our political system because of the court's serious mistake. And, and the dissenters in the case knew it. Your caller knows it. I think most people know there's really a fundamental distinction between corporations and human beings that the court should have recognized. Megan Green, you're sitting there nodding in <laughs> affirmation. Yes. Anything you want to add to that? You know, I, I think what we we need to talk about, too, is kind of the implications of this. Uh, you know, there was a study that was done that showed that of the, the 200 biggest corporate influencers, that there was $5.8 billion in lobbying that was spent over six, t or six years by these groups. And in return, what they ended up really getting back from government uh, in that was $4.4 4 trillion in support. I mean, that is just an astronomical amount of return um, that, that is happening to to unlevel the playing field, right? To to help some of those that are the most well off, the corporations that have the most money, which is often to the detriment of those who have the least. Because when we are giving these huge tax breaks um, or the these corporate subsidies, that often means it's money that we don't have to then provide basic level of services um, to constituents and the people whose voices who who we really need to be listening to in public policy, who whose agenda we really need to be forwarding. I'm just going to put our phone number out there. If people would like to weigh in and, on this subject, they can do so at 382-8255. Uh, Jeff, let me come back to you. We keep talking about corporations, and that's what this is all about. But we have to point out, as I did earlier, that unions are in on this too. And I wonder if the unions were, were put into this whole package just to make it a little more palatable somehow. Well, uh, you know, and actually it's it's really about money in the political system. And our campaign finan finance laws used to try to do, and didn't always, but tried to do a good job at making sure the money did not overwhelm the individual citizen's equal right to be represented and to participate. And so that applied to unions, it applied to corporations, and it applied to individuals. And we now have billionaires spending literally $80, 90000000 million in an election to influence the outcome. So it's, it's about billionaires, it's about unions, it's about corporations. Anywhere where you get aggregations of wealth, that's where the corruption danger and the danger to uh, ordinary American citizens being able to participate comes from. And so the law that the court struck down in the Citizens United case actually applied to unions and corporations. Mm -hmm. Unions had been in that law since, or, or a predecessor of the McCain-Feingold law since eight, uh, 1948 in Taft-Hartley. And so it, it isn't news that we should be regulating political money of, of entities, whether unions or corporations. What's absolutely new, and I think will be seen by history as a wildly reckless experiment, is mm -hmm. saying we don't have a right to do that anymore as Americans, and now we're just going to let the money flow in. Because, again, what happens is it gives representation to those who provide the dollars, and most Americans can't come anywhere near. I mean, I'm surprised to hear a $10,000 limit in a <laughs> local office. Right. How many Americans can give $10,000 to a candidate? Not very many, I'll tell you that. What is the process for amending the Constitution? There are two ways to go about it, as I recall. 
Um, what, but tell our audience what the process is. Yeah, so there are two ways. The way that we have always done it, 27 amendments so far, the way women got the vote, the way we elect senators, and many other good things in this country happened because we got a constitutional amendment through Congress. Two-thirds of a vote of Congress is needed. So both houses. Both houses, 67 senators, 290 House members. And then it goes out to the states for ratification. And the state legislatures then uh, decide whether this, that state is going to ratify an amendment. And we need three quarters of the states. That's 38 states. So there is the alternative method that some folks are pushing for, which if, if you kind of have given up on Congress, two thirds of the states can call a convention for the purpose of proposing such an amendment. And then it has to go through the same ratification process. And, you know, constitutional uh, change when Americans take it up, as we, as we do almost every generation, uh, you often see both methods kind of being pushed along, and then Congress finally gets it done, even if some are pushing for a convention. I, when we decided the amendment that said we're going to elect our senators instead of having them be appointed in a process that had become quite corrupt, um, they were one state away from a constitutional convention when the Senate woke up and said, hey, let's do an <laughs> amendment and pass the amendment. So that's the method, two-thirds of Congress, three-quarters of the states. Megan, is it realistic to think that politicians are going to vote uh, in favor of an amendment like this when they're the ones who are beneficiaries of all this money? I, I think it's a real <laughs> challenge. Um, you know, I I wear a couple different hats. In addition to being alderman, I sit on the Democratic National uh, committee. And, and I will say even within the Democratic Party, there's a lot of um, uh, disagreement about money. And uh, we passed a resolution, I guess, two two meetings ago that basically reinstated a corporate money ban and, and laying out who as a party we're not willing to take money from. And there was a lot of pushback of, well, how do we how do we compete? How do we get our message out if we don't take money from this? And I think then you have kind of the grassroots side, the flip side, who's saying we lose the trust of voters when we take money from these folks. And um, and that trust is worth more than any, you know, $500,000 donation that I could get from, from anybody else. So I, I think that, you know, this is a very cross-partisan issue. There's disagreements between within both the Republican and Democratic parties about the role uh, because it forces us as elected officials to have to take a very different way uh, to fund our campaigns, a, a more time-intensive way that is building small donor bases from individual donors rather than being able to go and get that, you know, large $100,000 dollar check and and fund our campaigns. Your take on that, Jeff? Oh, I think it, no amendment has ever been easy and, you know, American the American experiment isn't easy. Every every time we've ever made progress as a country, it's been because Americans step up and do hard work and this will be no different. But what we've also seen with amendments is that the politicians initially don't want to do it. I mean, an unelected all-male Senate did not want to pass amendments to give women the vote <laughs> and have to face the voters. Mm -hmm. And they are, were compelled to by the kind of grassroots citizen energy that this is driving. And we've seen it all around the country that politicians do step up and vote for this, whether they actually want to or not. Their voters are telling them, mm -hmm. you have to, or we're going to find other politicians. And so we've seen, we're about to release a report at American Promise of more than 200 Republicans mm -hmm. who have voted for amendment, 28th Amendment resolutions around the country. Hundreds of Democrats have done it. And, you know, we'll continue to see, I think, more and more pressure from the American people to say, we are going to change this system. And if you're going to live under the old rules, you know, we'd rather not have you be there. Thank you very much. We'll find someone who wants to you know, support this amendment and represent the people, not the donors. I'm going to try to get a quick call in here from Benjamin in St. Louis. Benjamin, make it very, very quick, if you would. Time is uh, passing quickly. Hi, yes. Um, quickly. I just wanted to say that um, Citizens United, I, I feel not only limited the um, ability of grassroots folks to um, influence their legislators um, for local issues like education, but it also um, disproportionately benefits large corporations over small businesses, which are, I feel, the heart of our uh, economy. Got to stop you there, That's Benjamin. All. The quick time's getting away. Well, he's making your, your point for you. 
Is he not? Well, he is indeed, and a lot of small business people support this amendment for that reason. In the minute we have left, uh, what's your your bottom line recommendation to people right now if they want to get involved? Well, right now, come on out tonight to the Ethical Society in St. Louis at 7 o'clock. It's 9001 Clayton Road, and we'll be doing the Writing the 28th Amendment project, and you can learn more about it. You can express your views. And then sign up and join us at AmericanPromise.net. Okay. And my final thought, Megan, in just a couple of seconds? I would say contact your, your elected officials. You know, the resolution that we passed at the board needs to be just a first step in St. Louis really starting to lead the way on some of these issues and getting some real uh, campaign finance limits in place and leading by example. Okay. Megan Green, thank you for being with us. Jeff Clements, thank you. Good luck with your meeting tonight. Thank you, Don. Great. Archive versions of past St. Louis on the Air programs available for download or podcast at stlpublicradio.org slash stlonair. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Don Marsh. Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com.